Welcome to our virtual class. Today we want to be thinking about the history of anthropology, which you are examining in close detail in Anthropology 230, and how it has been reflected in the evolution of applied anthropology. You're reading several articles which allow you to think about the convergence of different categories of anthropology that have evolved in the last couple of decades, um, public anthropology, practicing anthropology, and a whole host of things that seem to have evolved along separate tracks and then are now converging. You're in the middle of that convergence. And one of the things we want to really get across to you is that you can take these various labels and use them almost like different hats that you put on and take off depending on the client and the kind of project that you have. You can be agnostic. You don't have to be wed to any one theory or any one version or label of applied anthropology. One of the things that you'll discover is over the course of the career, you are a generalist and you will use whatever tool is most useful in your endeavors. Franz Boas, the father of American anthropology, uh, trained many of the students through Columbia and Berkeley, and then as that replicated to many other universities, in uh, studies of the American empire, largely Native American. Branislaw Malinowski was seminal in producing a set of anthropologists that went throughout the British empire looking at uh, cultures in Africa, South Asia, and the Antipodes in order to understand how to better implement and create policies that would affect the lives of those individuals. Their intent and motivation for this participation was that it was better to have informed policy than uninformed policy and that at least anthropologists with their close contact and and humanistic connection with the cultures in which they worked would have a more sympathetic and empathetic understanding and a better understanding of consequence than if policies were created from afar. And so this hidden legacy of colonial application was part of the ancestral spirit of anthropology, one which is roundly condemned in the 21st century. However, it has left a legacy which was, in fact, transformed. It was very clear in the second half of the 20th century that anthropologists who were being trained in the United States and in, in Britain and other English-speaking academic settings, that the old philosophy of how we approached culture and thought about culture and, and, and portrayed culture would be inappropriate to a more enlightened engagement with communities. And I'm going to, trans I'm going to um, consider this in a series of transformations of thought that went from one situation to another situation. So both Malinowski and Boaz tended to treat cultures as if they were isolated, as if they were a concrete other. Uh, if you look at, at Boaz's student, Krober, talking about Native American cultures within California as uh, almost isolated others, as if the Yokuts were highly differentiated from the Menachee um, and, and treated each one as a concrete other. That approach, that Boazian approach, was very fundamental. And the Melanowskian approach of looking at the Trobrianders as if they are a, a, a concrete and isolated other um, editing out every instance of connection with a broader public. Um, that, that was very typical of the early 20th century. And, and the people that the anthropologists interacted with tended to be dominant and powerful forces within that culture. Male, older, politically and economically active. Those were the people that were thought to embody what a culture really constituted. And the other people that were in the culture that were less dominant, children, women, ethnic minorities, they tended to be edited out of that narrative. 
when the narratives were being created both by boaz and by malinowski they employed an expert voice that reflected a kind of colonial hierarchy with white men largely white men coming in observing and then telling the story of that culture to the rest of the world and that expert voice was almost invisible the anthropologist was not really present in that narrative in a major way people were presented themselves kind of unselfconsciously um, with a hidden voice of authority not really presenting themselves as folks who lived within that society they treated their own voices as almost omniscient and in the mid 20th century after the 1950s and particularly after the very important uh, critiques that were presented in the 1960s there was a real shift in the way anthropologists wanted to approach the people with whom they worked and their own roles within communities and the focus was not to treat cultures as if they were isolated holistic others but to place those communities in a broader context and in fact uh, later when you in this class when you look at the video produced by Genevieve Bell uh, I encourage you to understand that the anthropology of today is the anthropology of context of actually placing communities within this larger political and economic and environmental context and that understanding that context is our secret sauce we also recognize that no community no matter how small is homogenous there is diversity diversity in age gender sexuality ethnicity all communities possess that diversity and it's just as important if not more important to represent that diversity than it is to describe the the measure of central tendency the average within a culture we also want to present a voice that not only includes the voices of anthropologists as they collect their data and report on that data but also engage a dialogue with the voices in the community and represent that dialogue in their writing so that you actually see the voices and hear the voices of people within that community and one of the things anthropologists have really become attuned to especially since the 1980s is understanding kind of reflexively our role as investigators in the relationship to the community often that relationship is a dominant one we're coming in as wealthier outsiders educated outsiders but increasingly as we do our field work throughout the world we're also studying up we're, we're coming in in a role of subordination asking more powerful elites to share their lives with us and the way in which we approach communities in the 21st century is quite distinct from the ways that Boaz and Malinowski did as more and more people became anthropologists uh, we shifted from uh, a kind of dominant elite that could afford to engage in this relatively esoteric specialty to people who were on the social margins of their culture and you see among the students of Boaz and Malinowski people who were of more humble origins people who were middle class or even working class uh, particularly as the 20th century unfolded and those people fared as you would expect people who were marginal women in particular were seen as at the edge of academia and uh, Zora Neale Hurston who is one of the shining lights of, of 20th century anthropology was in particular marginalized she wasn't able to earn her PhD she wasn't able to get an academic position she ultimately died in poverty and one of the things that we see over the course of the 20th century is that such people did increasingly well and Louise Lamphere the author of two of the articles that you are reading uh, is an example of someone who actually has moved from the margins 
toward the center of anthropology and has been recognized for her exemplary service to anthropology with the Franz Boas Award and recognized by the Society for Applied Anthropology with the Bronislaw Malinowski Award. But note in this photo that even though she has become more central to the field, much of her career she was the token woman in her department, and she had to struggle uh, to be recognized uh, to get tenure and to become a full professor and to establish herself in the field. And that the 20th century is a story of people moving from the margins toward the center of the discipline, and that the discipline itself became a broader and bigger tent that, that became more inclusive of people that would once be considered marginal. I don't want to overstate this because I think that there's still, uh, particularly in the elite institutions, the elite universities, uh, a very strong sense that you must come from the elite to stay in the elite, that you must be educated at an elite undergraduate institution, educated an elite graduate institution, and, and come from the kinds of means that would allow you to thrive um, in those kinds of universities. But as anthropology has grown, and particularly as applied anthropology has grown, more and more non-elite institutions, such as San Jose State, have been able to create opportunities for people who are on the margins to reshape anthropology into something that would make them more central. And we see in this transformation that there are still legacies of uh, Malinowski and Boaz that endure. We still are fundamentally connected to participant observations and an empathy with our hosts, the fashion that Malinowski established in his long stay in the Turbian Islands. We still focus on identifying social structures and the flow of goods and power, as did Malinowski. We still focus, as did Boaz, on collecting texts, utterances, often through interview, and finding culturally appropriate co-collaborators within communities, just as he worked with George Hunt and the Kwak Yudel, the Kwak Wakawak. And a fascination, a la Boaz, with cognitive processes. How does culture shape the way we think? And when we write or blog or create videos about anthropology, we're still trying very hard to convey a sense of we were there to establish our credibility as people who were um, informed directly in the field. And I want to help you see that you are directly connected to these ancestors of Franz Boas and Melanowski. They are your great, great, great grand professors. And so I produced this, this slide to help you see the, a genealogy of your connection uh, to these founding fathers through me, your professor. I had a professor, Sidney Story, whose professor, Harry Hoyer, ha was the student of the great linguist, uh, Edward Sapir, who was a student of Franz Boas. My, my professor, Paul Bohannon, was a direct student of E.E. E. Evans Pritchard, who was a student of Melanowski. So you are actively connected to these ancestors. And as you read in Anthropology 230, the voices of various theorists, and as you understand your place within the anthropological endeavor, understand that the ancestors are always with us. The ancestors inform the way we approach questions, the way we think about data, the way we work with communities to become co-collaborators. And that this story of transformation is a story that took place within our ancestral lineage. And the other thing that I really want you to pay attention to is the contested labels. Now, Lamphere, in two of her articles, um, that kind of dismisses some of these um, arguments as non-productive, and they probably are non-productive. But I want you to understand that these labels still have meaning. 
and you're going to be a part of that struggle. And as I mentioned in the beginning, I'd like you to think about these things agnostically. Don't identify with any particular label, but think about how that label reflects the kind of work that you have to do in the context in which you are doing it. Academic anthropologists are anthropologists that work at universities. While you are a graduate student at San Jose State, you are an academic anthropologist. Action anthropology was a, a, a philosophical and political effort to bring anthropology to bear on social issues and recognize that the colonies are done and that we need to move on and think about the implications of life in those post-colonial realities. Public anthropology is a call to engagement, engagement with media and policy, and bringing anthropology into the public in a way that we haven't seen since the days of Margaret Mead. Applied anthropology is a reality for almost all the world anthropologies. Only a very few places in the world, such as the United States, separate academic from applied anthropology. In most of the world, if you are an anthropologist, you are doing work in an applied setting. But for you, as American anthropologists, be aware that the job market in the U.S. is increasingly associated with applied anthropology. Practicing anthropology refers to a non-academic track of working in communities and organizations. One of the things that I have seen in interviewing practicing anthropologists, that as they are hiring, they don't want to hire someone who is taking a practicing position because they couldn't make it in academia. They couldn't get that tenure track job. And so, ah, you might as well do some practice. They want people who are dedicated to becoming those kinds of clinicians, those practitioners who will bring anthropology into the world. And you bring anthropology into the world uh, often in nonprofit work and community work through advocacy. It, which is work that is focused with or on behalf of particular communities. And you are not going to be any one of those things, but you will mix those labels, those roles, those flavors of anthropology, depending on the kind of work that you're doing in the future. And what you'll need to do as you think about building your toolkit throughout this year in Applications Core A and B is think about the role of critique. You want to bring a critical eye, but if you only bring a critical eye without having good basic foundational data, you will not be adding value to the community. You need to think about how to have really clear communication in order to make this an effective form of applied anthropology.